Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you for joining us here on the first service of the eve of our Lord and Savior's birth. Uh, blessings to you as we gather here together to worship and as you go forward from this place to celebrate with your families today and tomorrow as well. So Merry Christmas. Let us begin our worship service with uh, our opening hymn, O Come All Ye Faithful, hymn number 379. Please stand. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In the stillness of Christmas Eve, a child is born, wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. God's greatest gift is given. In the miracle and mystery of God's Son, born in human flesh, God has given us his salvation. Alleluia. On the eve of Christ's birth, we add the light of the Christ candle to our Advent wreath reminding us that Jesus Christ came to conquer the darkness of sin and lead us into the light of his glorious kingdom. The candles of hope, peace, joy, and love have shone into the darkness and promised the coming of a greater light, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the true light of the world. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness shall not overcome it. Lord Jesus, promised Savior and King, you are the life and the light of men. Bless the light of this Advent wreath, that it may illuminate the story of your birth and be a beacon to the promise of your second coming. Amen. Amen. This Christmas, may Christ's gift of hope, peace, joy, and love be with you. And also with you. You may be seated as we sing together, What Child Is This?
The Old Testament prophecy reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 14. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol, or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men, that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Here ends our reading. We sing together, it came upon a midnight clear.
Please stand. The Christmas Eve Gospel as recorded in the book of Matthew, the first chapter. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Here ends our reading. We sing together, Away in a Manger. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It's Christmas Eve day, a time filled with anticipation, twinkling lights, and maybe a few last minute gift wrappings. Okay, fine, I admit it, all the gift wrappings. I have not wrapped a single present yet this year, but pastors are busy at Christmas time. Especially with all the extra work getting back into the sanctuary and even the narthex. Wasn't it nice to use the main entrance again? Right? Mini Christmas miracle for us. But that's not what we want to talk about here today. Today we gather for a specific reason. We gather not just because of tradition or the promise of tomorrow's festivities, but because of a story. A story so powerful, so profound, that it split history in two. The birth we celebrate on this night literally splits history and everything that becomes before and everything that comes after it. That's a powerful event, a world-changing point that we've acknowledged in the history of the human race. So let me tell you the story. We turn to Matthew chapter 1 for our Christmas Eve reading. And I know what you're thinking. Ah, the Christmas story. 
angels, shepherds, a manger. I know this one by heart. But hold on, Matthew's version is maybe a little different than the full story you have in your head. There are no shepherds here, no inns with limited availability, no chorus of angels in the sky. Most all that comes from Luke's gospel account. Instead, Matthew, in his gospel, he begins with the the part before our reading that we cut out today. Matthew begins with genealogies. Exciting, I know, right? Which is why the rest of this sermon will be an in-depth analysis of each branch of Jesus' family tree. (laughs) Just kidding, right? No, I mean, that would make for a pretty bad Christmas sermon, I know. But don't underestimate the importance of the genealogy that Matthew records. He begins with Abraham, and he continues on down the line of David. He carefully outlines the generations, meticulously connecting Jesus to Israel's history. Why does Matthew choose to begin his account this way? Well, it's because he wants us to recognize that Jesus is not just an ordinary baby born on a cold winter night. Okay, we're talking about the Middle East, right? Bethlehem's cold winter nights are basically Cleveland's nice spring days. But regardless, what's important is that this baby comes with a whole chapter of prerequisite lineage. To understand who this baby is, Matthew needs to connect him to the fulfillment of ancient prophecies. He has to establish him as the long-awaited Messiah who would, be, who would bring salvation and redemption to God's chosen people. That's the story that's going to be told. It was known that the Savior would come from the line of King David, so definitively placing Jesus in that line was important. But then we we finally make it through the genealogies, and Matthew draws the line all the way from Abraham to Joseph. Good old Joseph. A man of few words, but great character. Let's paint the picture. Joseph is a carpenter by trade, and he's betrothed to Mary. Betrothal back then was like being married, but not yet living together. Joseph is spending his time getting ready, preparing the home, while Mary prepares the garments and the linens that she would bring to their household. They both would spend about a year getting things arranged to start their lives together. But then, contrary to all his plans and expectations, Joseph finds out that Mary is expecting, and he hadn't planned for that. Because he knows unequivocally, biologically, without a doubt, he is not the father. Joseph's no dummy. He knows how babies are made, and there's no chance that that's his kid. So that means that his betrothed, his legally wed wife, had betrayed him in the worst way possible. Now put yourself in Joseph's sandals for a moment. How would you feel? You'd probably be pretty angry. Understandably so. We often kind of breeze through this part of the story, so imagine it for a second. Joseph's anger must have been palpable, coursing through his veins like a raging river. Betrayal seared his heart, leaving him feeling vulnerable, hurt, and deceived. But amidst this storm of emotions, a glimmer of compassion shone through the wrath of his heart. He knew that exposing Mary to public shame would only bring more pain to both of them. Deep down, he apparently still cared for her, despite the shattered trust. And let's not forget, this is a culture where death by stoning was still practiced. And what it appeared that Mary had done was pretty bad. Even for adultery, it was pretty bad. So this isn't just unexpected news. It's life turning upside down news. But Joseph, being the righteous man he is, plans to handle this quietly. He doesn't want to disgrace Mary and her family. He isn't going to stand on his soapbox and insist that she be made to answer for her sins. Can we just take a moment and appreciate Joseph? Here is a man who, even stewing in his own doubt, hurt, and pain, does not react as the world would react. Joseph shows us another way, a way of mercy. It's like 
It's like God chose a good adoptive father for his son or something, right? And even if this story were to somehow abruptly end here, we could still walk away from it with a role model and a nice moral to the story. Be kind. Be forgiving. Be merciful. Even when it's hard. Even when you're hurting. But that's not the reason we tell the Christmas story. In fact, this story is so dramatic that Joseph's moral lesson doesn't typically even register on our radars. No, it's at this point that the story really begins to get good. An angel appears to this distraught young husband in a dream. Joseph, son of David. Again, because genealogy is important here, remember? Do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So the baby is from God, and not a result of infidelity. Which, you know, that's great news, relieving news. However, that proclamation doesn't really fix everything, does it? In fact, I'd say it just complicates things twice over. Because the most important part of what the angel declares is that this baby, this child, Joseph, is being instructed to adopt and name Jesus, will, as the angel says, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This baby will save his people from their sins. Now, there are a lot of things that are promised to newborn parents about babies, right? They they will keep you up at night. They will be the greatest source of joy and frustration of your life. They will fill you with pride and make you feel entirely unprepared. They will change your life. They will be the worst smelling thing you ever really wanted to hold tight. (laughs) But only one child has ever come with the promise that he will save his people from their sins. The angel says that this baby is to be named Jesus. Which, okay, that's, that's anglicized a little bit, right? In Hebrew, it's Yeshua, which means the Lord saves. And you get that by just shoving together those two words, God's name and saves. So it's not like a hidden meaning or anything like that. Which means that every time that Joseph called his son's name, he'd be declaring God's salvation, God's intent for this child, to save his people, to save him. This is the child that Joseph is being told to raise. But that's not quite all of it. It It's really much more intimidating than that. This isn't just a child. This is God himself in human form. And it's not like this is lost on Joseph. He doesn't get to be blissfully ignorant of whom he's raising. Joseph would have known the prophecies about the Messiah. From Isaiah 7, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel. That's another compound word, this time from from three words. With us God. Not God far away, not God watching from a distance, but God with us. In this mess, in the joy, in the ordinary and the extraordinary of life. God living in Joseph's house. God eating at Joseph's table, a table that undoubtedly this carpenter had made with his own hands. This is the life ahead of Joseph. You and I, we might look at this future and go running and screaming in the other direction, but not Joseph. Silent, strong Joseph says nothing, but does exactly what's needed. Joseph wakes up from his dream and does what the angel commanded. There's no record of him questioning or hesitating. It's as if in that dream everything clicked into place for Joseph and his faith and his trust all overrode his fear and his doubts. And so Joseph took Mary as his wife, embracing her and her child, despite the misunderstanding that the world would now view them with. 
because Joseph accepted that this child she carried was not just an ordinary child. He was the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of his people. The weight of this realization settled upon Joseph's shoulders, and he did not falter. He became a father, the adopted earthly father of the divine. And days turned into weeks, and weeks into months, nine months to be exact, and they traveled to Bethlehem together. They traveled to Bethlehem together, (laughs) following the census decree of Caesar Augustus, acting out the divine prophecy unfolding before their eyes. Amidst the hustle and the bustle of the crowded city of David, they sought refuge where they could because, you know, they were traveling at Christmas and that's always a hard time to travel. (laughs) But it was there that Jesus was born and placed in a lowly manger. The cries of the newborn Jesus echoed throughout the night, mingling with the sounds of the animals and the hushed whispers of the shepherd shepherds who had been led by the heavenly host to bear witness to this sacred event. Joseph gazed upon Mary and the child, his heart filled with awe and wonder on that most holy of nights. What's your heart filled with today? It's a good question, right? I mean, you know, this is a sermon. We've got to bring it home. We're here centuries later, thankfully back in our sanctuary, celebrating the birth of Jesus right where we want to be. But this isn't just about celebrating an event. It's not about where we are, the sights, the sounds, the smells of Christmas. It's about the story. It's still about the story. Because the story speaks to each of us. It's a story for us. And it's a story that continues. It continues beyond that night in Bethlehem. Beyond the humble manger where the Savior of the world lay. It continues with Joseph, with Mary, with you, and with me. This story is at the heart a gift. A gift for us. We give Christmas gifts because Christmas was given to us. A gift given from God to each of us because we need it. We need a Savior here and now. Christ is, in every way, the perfect gift for us. It's not like the husband who decided to get his mother-in-law what he thought was the perfect gift. A very practical, thoughtful, and valuable Christmas gift. He purchased for her a beautiful and peaceful plot in the nicest cemetery in town. A little unconventional, perhaps, but he knew her to be a practical woman who would appreciate such a gift. And to his credit, nothing was too good for his mother-in-law. He spared no expense, which truly impressed his wife and her mother. The next year, however, he gave her an empty box for Christmas. Of course, the mother-in-law asked why the box was empty, and he replied, Well, why would I buy you something this year when you haven't even used the gift I gave you last year? (laughs) That's how you start a Christmas fight. (laughs) But this gift given to us on Christmas, a Savior sent to offer us forgiveness, well, that is a gift that we can, we must immediately put to use. And that gift of a Savior continues to be of use to each of us as we navigate our lives, often grappling with the challenges and unexpected turns of life, just like Mary and Joseph did. How often we find ourselves in situations where the path ahead seems unclear, where our expectations are turned upside down, and where we must choose between reacting with this world's logic or responding with faith and trust in God. This story of Jesus' birth is not just words on a page or another verse to a feel-good carol. 
It's a narrative that speaks to our lives, to our own relationship with God. So often I hear people say that God doesn't speak to them. That's ridiculous. This story of Christ being born of humanity is a clear call directly from God to you. God is reaching down from heaven to earth on this day, and he is speaking to you. We gather on this day to hear the story told as part of our lives. We gather because, like Joseph, we are called to trust in God's plans, even when they defy our understanding. We gather because, in the cries of a newborn baby in Bethlehem, we hear the sound of God entering our world, our very lives. We gather because, in this story, we find hope. The hope that God is indeed with us. Emmanuel, in every moment, in every challenge, in every joy, and in every sorrow. So as we light our candles, sing our carols, and find sanctuary in the warmth of this sanctuary, let us carry the essence of this story in our hearts. Let us be like Joseph, who despised Despite his initial fears and doubts, embrace the role that would forever change his life. Let's be open to the unexpected ways God might be speaking to us, leading us to act with compassion, mercy, and faith. And as we move from this holy night back into the routines of our daily lives, let us remember that the miracle of Christmas isn't confined to a single night or even a particular season. It's an ongoing miracle of God's presence in our world, in our lives, in our everyday. In our encounters with others, in our choices, and our actions, we have the opportunity to live that message of this night. To show love, to, to, to offer forgiveness, to be the source of comfort and strength, to bring light, the light of Christ, into our lives and the lives of those around us. This, this is the true spirit of Christmas. God with us. God with you. May the story of that first Christmas continue to resonate with your every Christmas. May it inspire you to live this day and every day with faith, hope, and love. And may the peace and joy of Christ be with you this Christmas, and always. Amen. And I know that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us now stand as the offerings are brought forward to the Lord. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, on the eve of your son's birth, we stand in awe of the mystery of the Incarnation, and we bring our offerings with hearts full of gratitude and wonder. May these gifts given in celebration of your son, your greatest gift to us, be used to spread your light and love in a world that so deeply needs it. Bless them, multiply them, and use them to bring hope, peace, joy, and love in your name. Amen. You may be seated.
Please stand. As we celebrate Christ's presence in the manger, let us also celebrate the presence of Christ among us, in, with, and under the bread and wine of this holy sacrament. Let us pray in repented faith and seek God's mercy for our sins. Almighty and holy God, we come before you in our weakness and our sin. We know that we have failed you often and have not followed your commands. We have neglected to give to others the true gift of faith. We pray for mercy, not account of our own goodness, but because of the sacrifice of your Son, our Emmanuel. Just as you led the Magi, draw us closer to the Christ. In the, in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was sent to be born in Bethlehem so that we might see the light. As the light of this world, he sacrificed himself for you, and for his sake, God forgives us our sins. Therefore, in his stead and by his command, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let us pray on this holy night for God's peace and power to rest upon us, upon all who are in need. Dear Heavenly Father, we rejoice at the birth of your Son in Bethlehem. He came to save us and to reveal your love and compassion to us. Christ came to bring you healing and to restore our lives to wholeness. May the light of Christ shine upon each of us this night, and may our hearts receive him gladly. O oh Lord, we pray for those who do not believe. Be at work in their lives and use us to make your love for them tangible and real. Help us to be your instruments as we share the blessings we have received in Christ. We pray tonight for those who are lonely, troubled, or separated from loved ones. We remember all those who are in need of your healing. Lay your hand of blessing upon them, O Lord. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The shepherds believed the angelic announcement and went to find their Savior. We have also heard the good news and seek our Lord. They found their Savior, the long-promised Messiah, in a stable's manger, and we shall find him in the bread and wine. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For in the mystery of the Word made flesh, you have given us a new revelation of your glory, that seeing you in the person of your Son, we may know and love those things that are not seen. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. You may be seated.
The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will strengthen and preserve you, steadfast to the one true faith, to life everlasting. Depart in his peace and go in his joy. You may be seated.
Please stand. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth.